um let me come to the next part then i'll also again discuss in detail the transfer impact assessment the ssc part so it will come in the next slide so that then i'll give more brief about it okay okay so now that you have done the vendor side so let's mm. now focus on the training side mm. okay so training so my idea of training is to do it two ways okay so one if you let's say take gdpr what gdpr says that everybody in the organization should be trained at least once okay okay now what i will do i will either make a if let's say i have a lms portal i will make a training video post it people see it i capture the recordings of the like who how many people attended and so on so that i have attendance because this is also one of the artifact which we need to maintain as a part of accountability standard okay so this is one way let's say you don't have a lms portal so how we will do so at least you will have something like teams or zoom or something on that teams also you can nowadays take attendance mm. so also i used to take it from the back end team but now it's pretty straight forward you can just take the so you try to maintain this so you run two three sessions in like one once a week twice a week whatever and then those who are free can jo- join in and make sure that they have attend they okay. these are two ways so the idea here is to give them a basic insight that yes the, what is data privacy what is a data controller processor uh, what are the uh, what is records of processing activity what is dpia and all those things so that because the idea is that these are the things which will be coming towards them in some uh, way or the other probably in the near future when the data privacy office thinks about doing certain assessment or thinks about doing certain analysis then these are the activities so it's good that they have knowledge about this and also for us as a regulatory requirement it is very necessary that everybody is trained at least once so this really? is how we do. okay now the next part which is in the next slide is role based training okay so this is a general training then second is a role based training how i approach role based training is i conduct a let's say one hour or two hour workshop in which i make sure uh, the relevant business team sits let's take the same example of hr okay so the hr will hr team will come so there will be a two hour workshop where i'll tell them that as a part of records of processing activity what is uh, the requirement i have from you guys then what is a dpia i'll try to uh, give them a insight about you know what is the process and how we will help you to identify risk at the same time we just want certain inputs from you so the idea here is to make people understand the concept who are facing the business who are, or who are facing the sensitive part of the business so those who are handling lot of personal data so hr being the one sales team customer uh, relationship team so these are the people who generally are face of the you uh, know data subject right so for them we take these kind of departments on priority and train them in a role based training so that they they know that okay these are the kind of concepts uh, we need to understand and let me give you an example in recruitment for example mm-hmm. what i had identified earlier in recruitment um, the company uh, in one of the company where i was working they were keeping the resume for one year under the pretext that um, they will it might be of help to them or no it was not one year it was around 2 2 to 3 years okay. okay now what we argued that okay even even certain persons uh, you know qualification or at least work experience changes in 2 to 3 years so at least try to keep it 6 months or 1 year because uh, the purpose the underlying purpose only you are missing out and whenever we also found out that whenever they had a opening in the organization they always used to post it on linkedin nobody bothered visiting that and so, so for because resume has lot of personal information and we Uh, we as a data office, it's a nightmare for us to manage oh, this kind of data. So that is where then you know you in that um, role based training session you try to identify that these kind of processes which are happening, which probably I'm not saying that you at the same time give the uh, you know outcome to them, mm. but at least you write it down and do your thorough analysis and then you can come up come up with the outcome. So that is the idea of role based training, so that you can even deliver and at the same time take it from them. that how things are working around so that is the logic so that was one example i wanted to give real time 
so the way we have yeah. isms trainings like you know mandatory to have a security awareness and all that same like when yeah. gdpr requirement is there to conduct the privacy awareness training right yes yes okay. so yes it's a non compliance if you don't do that like it's like uh, it's a non compliance so depends on which jurisdiction you fall into if you are fall into the these uh, stringent ones like gdpr then yes it's a non compliance but if you are into middle eastern probably it's not that much of a uh, no intensity right now but mm. in some places like saudi arabia definitely in uae it's still upcoming so uae will grow as as soon as possible so that is the case but my idea would be that yes make sure that at least one basic round of training happens so that uh, nobody questions uh, the data privacy office understood okay <clears throat> after that uh, the records of processing activity that you make on the basis on that you make a pii inventory list now what is the idea of this list <clears throat> so when your organization is there there will be certain personal information it will be using let's oh. say 20 50 100 when i was working with tcs they had more than um, 120 attributes personal attributes they were using okay so they were taking really good care of it because they had an idea of how these things were structured okay now <clears throat> this pii inventory list how it helps because you have this pii inventory list you can categorize what is a personal data what is a sensitive personal data now why these two distinction is important mm -hmm. so when it comes to regulation in regulation there is a specific distinction between uh, these two processing of the data so what the regulation tells is that if there is some data identified as sensitive data then you need to take extra care of it like there should have they should have a good technical and organizational measures when we say technical and organizational measures basically these are all isms standards only so you have uh, you no know, good encryptions uh, you have data masking in place then uh, you have good access control privilege access management all these things comes under that so why it is important because the idea of sensitive data is uh, the regulation says that it's that data that if it gets exposed let's say accidentally then it might cause a considerable harm to a person so for example if my um, let's say a uh, criminal record gets you know released out in public i might not be very comfortable with it people will frown upon me because of the mistakes that i have might have done earlier or whatever it can be whatever or it can be a false case but it's still a criminal record because generally in hr uh, when you are joining they do the background check and in mm. that we have submit the police verification report to in some organizations for example mm -hmm. so in that cases we need to be very careful so for such cases so for such places what i'll do i'll make sure that the data either it's deleted once the background check is done for example or if there is a positive um, background check in it let's say there was some criminal record if you are storing it only one or two person will have access to it and if you have to open that account probably you will have to take approval from infosec team and it team and then only you will oh. get to access it. so these kind of controls i'll put in place so this is where the identification of sensitive and uh, um, personal data comes into play where <clears throat> out of 100 it can be a possibility that 10 are sensitive data then how which first of all your um, idea will be that which all the processes let's say in my 200 processes i have so in the 200 process it can happen that 20 process are using sensitive personal data then my uh, program plan i will devise in such a way that when i am doing a privacy impact assessment let's say then i will make sure that these 20 comes first rather than the rest because these are more high risk kind of environment so this is where a pii inventory list comes handy and uh, it's not like it's a separate thing probably when you are doing a records of processing activity itself during that time only you can side by side maintain the inventory list so that is the idea okay okay so this was on the first uh, going ahead then we have maintaining data inventory basically yes maintaining is nothing but whatever you have you have to you know keep it updated every year so it's not like a one time kind of an activity so you will realize that most of the activities that we do here are more repetitive so every year or every two years you have to 
uh, see because for example risk analysis you have to do it every year uh records of processing activity probably you will have to update it but in order to update you need to reach out to everyone right because mm. if you don't reach out you will not know what is new in the business bro so similarly uh, this also you need to maintain at a regular interval to see maybe you can have it every two years also that's fine but make a habit that do it in a cyclic way after that we come to the uh, concern management policy so consent management okay so consent management again a very difficult uh, i would say process to implement like the name suggest uh, people are very you know keen that oh consent is yeah we will take consent from the data subject then that's it but that is not how it works because you see the you understand the background of it you are taking consent and uh, you are processing the data Uh, so the idea is that you are so well versed with your business process that you know each thing in and out of the business process why because if tomorrow a business uh, uh, or the data subject revokes the consent removes their consent then that flow should happen within your business process mm. so majorly that is the challenge that how that should flow within the business process one good way to do it that you ha- have a a uh, consent management tool in place which will solve most of your uh, queries here but uh, like i said data privacy is a very new thing so not people don't have budget for these kind of projects no but it is mandatory uh, yeah so in india it's mandatory now so let's see how that will roll out because we haven't seen yet the implications so people will have to i think start the now at the consent management tool guys will have a good time i believe <laughs> with the, you know selling this particular product so the idea is to manage consent so tool is one part but let's say you are doing it manually now how would you do it manually so consider if you don't have our records of processing activity or the data flow thing it will be very difficult for you right managing consent because True. my it can happen that hr hr is collecting all the personal information from hr it is going to finance department it can happen that from finance department it is going to operations department and not directly from hr this is like on the sub level so in that case it becomes very important for me to know what is the source and if i have this understanding of data flow between uh, within the organization then i can even manually say that okay that particular person has revoked the consent so either within 7 days you stop processing the data but again i personally find it very difficult and even i have realized that not many organization the legal base concept that we were discussing earlier not many organization you use this consent uh, as a legal basis probably mm-hmm. they will rely on legitimate interest or they will rely on performance of contract so these are the two major ones which are used followed by legal obligation okay so um, that is where consent becomes very very difficult so policy making is still easy but this process set up the pro- consent creation process this is very very difficult process so probably that is why people keep it as a phase 2 or a phase 3 because first phase it's always about making sure that you have policies in place and you have records of processing activity if these two align with each other then the rest things follow easily okay then we have data subject request policy now data subject request is also one of uh, a technical term you can say so what is a data subject request so each regulation across the globe they have given certain uh rights to the data subject okay mm. so for example right to be informed right to have access to that data right to delete my data right to erase uh, right to rectification and there are many more <clears throat> so there are these seven eight rights which are common which are common in let's say all the regulation like right to inform right to access mm. uh, right to uh, erase these are common ones uh, basically there are some different ones for example gdpr has right to data portability <coughs> sorry so in right to data portability <clears throat> so things will be pretty different so it will be it means that you have to port 
the data from my organization so for example if i am a insurance company if a data subject comes tomorrow that uh, kindly share my data to that particular insurance company it's my obligation to do that so that is in gdpr so i think in india it's not there is nowhere nothing mentioned on right to data portability as of now okay so yeah we were discussing on data subject request so lot of jurisdiction have lot of these rights so you identify then if basis on your jurisdiction you identify that okay these are the my policies uh, so no so these are my jurisdiction so what are the rights and then basis on the rights you make a data subject request policy so what is this policy B- bsr policy is nothing but how you will be managing the entire process of data subject request Hmm. now once data subject comes to you what will you what will be your step so you should know right you should have a clear background idea about it so sure. how would you do it? so first thing let's say you set up a interface through which the data subject request will come to you either it can be via web either it can be via a call center it can be via email or it can be through direct phone call so sure. that um, this is so you identify as per your business what is your key requirement after that uh, they let's say raise um, data subject raises a request then your step should be to validate whether the person who's calling me is really my you know is really present in my system or they are calling on someone's behalf mm. so that particular setup so for that probably you might have to take certain unique identifier from them <clears throat> your system it can be possible that email address is your unique identifier because name can be common but email address cannot be so email so likewise you ask them that what is okay then for that so and so for request we need your so you valid, validate once you validate there should be a setup in your business process so that you know where to go for example if i was asked to remove um, you know my revoke my consent on marketing or i mm. don't want to receive marketing emails for example then i should know internally that which are the departments in which the my particular data subjects data is flowing so it can either be marketing team and it can be sales team so once i remove it from door i inform them both that kindly remove then i can go back to the data subject and tell that okay from 7 days onwards you will not receive that confirmation so this entire data subject request is a big process so that is why a policy is required so that these kind of processes can be built around it now it becomes difficult again to manually make it work but it's not as difficult as consent management mm. uh, i have built it uh, uh, like in one of the organizations from ground up the entire dsr process and it worked well because we had a very comprehensive records of processing activity so that is why it worked well okay <clears throat> so that is on the dsr side then again data retention uh, i have kept it separately why because you will realize that in a once you start this program data deletion is a major challenge not True. many organization uh, deletes you no know, data they if you ask them they said that we have data from inception okay so that is the case so that is why this data retention policy uh, is important now many people in data retention policy also argues that data retention is the maximum time i need to keep or minimum time i need to keep the data but the regulation doesn't say that you delete the data after retention okay they, what they say that kindly retain the data for 10 years hmm. but the idea in some regulation the explicitity is not there the exclusiveness is not there they delete the data but at the same time if you refer so my argument to that is if you refer the principles of those any uh, jurisdiction or any uh, regulation they will say that only use the data as long as necessary so if your retention is there and, and if the principle is saying then how can you argue that it has to be kept you know at for the later stage so that is generally how i try to you know see it so this was uh, this was with when i was working with one of the consulting firms i had this um, experience so that is why i'm sharing it <laughs> and 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 you know uh, there is always a um, 
documentation process which is common across the same but they use a different mm-hmm. names for the for the sake of their internal business process so how you handle that particular issue then because see if you so take an cool. example of mm-hmm. having this policies or you having the setup consent forms and all that different different companies mm-hmm. basically using their different different terms mm-hmm. so how you overcome that in that case so uh, standardize um, see either you decide as a privacy office that these are the nomenclatures i'll be using or uh, you <coughs> go with iso standard which is 27701 so probably in that in the iso toolkit there are a lot of toolkits available these days so whatever okay. the documentation so you go with that so my idea is that i keep it simple whatever is the content is the name basically if it's a retention it's a retention so i don't you know think about that what should come first and last i try to keep it as minimalistic as possible and that is how uh, all my documents are well structured well documented everything so that is one way to look at it and i, I think um, i don't know toolkit if infosec uh, train gives the toolkit or not but uh, there are contents which are available online which you can refer okay that is the case the personally i i liked one was i think it was from itgovernance.uk i think so okay it was a good toolkit at least the names i'm not saying i have used the toolkit but the naming wise it was very good so the names of the policy that you want mm. it's there so you can refer that if you want okay all right so then training of role based we discuss setting up of consent collection we discuss then comes privacy impact assessment for vendors so earlier privacy impact assessment we did for internal business processes where let's say sensitive data was used or where we realized that there was high risk to the data subject now similarly we also do vendor impact assessment so when let's say when you are onboarding uh, you do a basic information security check so at the same time you even do the privacy check you either align with the both the team or you can have it separate but my suggestion would be align because nobody likes to fill up two assessment it's the boring work i get so many assessment myself to fill uh, as a vendor so that's why and uh, secondly uh, there will be lot of existing vendors which will be there so probably if you are starting something program this program as a new program then you have to do one round of check on those people as well so that is where you will do impact assessment so the idea is pretty simple that you see what kind of controls what they have agreed in the contracts try to see whether they are able to prove that via either artifacts so for example if they are able to present a data privacy policy they are able to present the confidentiality agreement signed between them or those who will be using it. the personal data so on and so forth so there are these seven eight ways or artifacts which you even see it will be good enough to make a judgment that okay particular vendor is good enough and we can share the data without any concerns so that is where the internal data protection comes into play then we have breach management policy breach management again a very big concept in itself uh, the idea here is um, we shouldn't run around when there is a breach there should be a proper idea in place there should be a proper setup which you have already devised for example fire 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 what, yeah exactly <laughs> what kind of template you will be using to the regulations yeah. then you should know that if a breach happens then uh, the intensity of the breach so you decide so for example 0 to 100 if let's say 0 to 100 records of breach uh, then only inform the regulators don't inform the data subject if more than 1000 are breach inform the data subject as well so so on so this will be again depending upon your organization business with jurisdiction and that that way there is no standard one way to go with this the standard one way is just report in 72 hours the breach should be reported to regulators mm. in 72 yeah. hours and 72 calendar days not working days so that is very important and <clears throat> so this is where um, the idea of having a setup so you should have a breach response team in place so for example information security will be contacted first uh, the uh, senior management will be contacted will be notified about it then uh, the 
let's say it happened in certain business process let's say hr or marketing so marketing head or marketer so we should know that these are the people key people who will be uh, involved in this then we also decide that what will be the kind of procedure probably it will be cut off the system from the entire rest of the uh, you know uh, organization till the time we identify whether this breach is internal external or what it is so um, i think from information security perspective also this is very important that breach so uh, so infosec and uh, data privacy team generally uh, work together in this particular thing one key thing to note here is you maintain a privacy risk register just to make sure that you know that what kind of breaches are happening it doesn't necessarily have to be that if something for example somebody have put in wrong password so the so soft team will still give you an alert so that doesn't mean a breach so it means genuine, genuine so it's upon data privacy officer to decide after looking at an incident whether it's a breach and if it's a breach whether it needs to be informed to the regulators or not okay if record if one unauthorized access is there we will not record this to the regulators of course because that's uh, because that's waste of time similarly if there are more than 1000 records getting you know exposed out in the public so on then we need to inform that's okay. the case Uh, the reason why I ask is because you know in the, in one of the services where where I was involved in breach management and all that, so there is no policy. There's just a process, and this origin is mm-hmm. also so. In, initially, what happened when you're talking about uh, uh, information security incidents and all, there was no established process we had. Mm-hmm. So, so from that perspective, I believe this is a very good point that you have raised. Mm. Yeah, that's that's what people you know generally miss out. Oh. Uh, but this is very important because i also learned from experience that we need to be pretty much ready before it happens it's such very difficult hmm okay then coming to the last part of it privacy by design as many also like to call it good to have hmm. rather than have. but in if you go work in regulations like uh, gdpr and all data pri- uh, privacy by design is also one of the key aspects so what is the idea here so idea here is that when you are starting a business process or anything related to personal data you have to think about protection of personal data as a first phase and not as a last phase so let's say you are doing sdlc okay software development life cycle so you know that right? then first is requirement phase then design phase then implement then deploy and production so they are saying that don't think about privacy in the production phase when we are everything so think about privacy in the requirement phase itself or as early as phase. possible yeah as early as possible that is the idea so if you know as early as possible that okay these are the things which i need to have then you will also think on those lines that okay when let's say while collecting while writing a code for example you you will say what uh, like when i was working in tcs we have observed this what people used to do the application team who used to develop select star and take all the uh, data from the table under the context that these data might be usable in the future but if you see our principle of data minimization what it asks it asks that collect only what is necessary so this is where privacy by design comes very handy and we can evaluate these kind of incidences which is happening within the business process so this is where then you design the template accordingly so for application team it will be different for businesses it will be different for management it will be different and so on so i mean it's a lecture in itself <laughs> so i will not go into detail here but just the idea is that privacy by design is very important and we have to think about data privacy from the beginning phase okay so these are the core models which are there as a part of uh, any data privacy program you pick up or any regulation you pick up these are the things that that they will ask you to do and that is what we do generally in the privacy program and after that you just uh, make sure that every month or every quarter you have a, a dashboard of report stating that you let's say reviewed 100 contracts in this quarter or you did or you trained of 500 people in this quarter so that dashboard basis on your organization needs requirement jurisdiction you make and have it and then 
probably it is good that you make that internal audit then by yourself or either you hire uh, i wouldn't say hire hiring would be an external audit but still make sure that if you are a dpo either ask somebody from infosec team to do that particular assessment so that there is a non biased uh, audit and you will get a better result for so and bhai one, one one point i want to add here is there is a right, there is a lot of buzzword right now <clears throat> dpo and ceo is working together well, dpo and ceo as a single role i was surprised is it possible because uh, we need because i have seen lot of linkedin profile mention deep and global yeah, yeah. data privacy officer and ceo so i was wondering mm. it's it's not a conflict of interest the way we have audit 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 activity mm. i thought i will ask now, you this so yes so see the idea of dpo now if you take gdpr the idea of dpo is it reports to the highest authority in the organization same like so internal audit of- Same like internal audit. Board of, yeah. board of directors or C hmm. C X O S. Hmm. That is the idea. Why this is the idea? It was the idea because they didn't want any influence at a mid managerial level. Okay. Why this mid managerial level influence was not required? Because while choosing, let's say, a particular vendor, they will choose someone who will have, let's say, influence of pricing, or probably they might have certain outcome out of it because it it is less on their budget though they are not taking care of privacy it is less on, that's why the role had been designed in such a way that the highest uh, authority on the dp will be reporting to only them mm. so if you take mm. so for example now ciso <clears throat> is basically responsible let's say in making sure what vendor they take for let's mm. say xdr mdr whatever you call it uh, then uh, if they have to even hire for penetration testing or you know vulnerability assessment they will they will have their say in selecting the vendor mm. now that same particular uh, person cannot think on a non biased way from data privacy angle because True. they are the uh, decision makers so that okay. is why the decision makers be it any role not just ceo are not generally uh, taken into this dual role there are many arguments over it that ceo does the same thing and all but the decision making power is what people generally miss if some role has a decision making because dpo doesn't have a decision making power exactly dpo only has the role to see whether all the things are happening Uh, as it should be okay even if you have to hire or have a data privacy tool it's the procurement team who decides that what tool will come you you, you give your proposal to them it's not you who will decide that oh come to me so that is the idea and that is why ceo and dpo for me at least i don't see as a thing or a role which is you know goes hand in hand as the case that's great so when you done with this audit and all that so what is the final report but that, do we have such kind of a final report which okay we are gdpr compliance or we are so something like that we call yes it. yes so we call it as a dpo report generally mm-hmm. okay. now dpo report what it consists of it consists of um, the thing that um, first of all the framework it will consist of your framework it will consist of the um, obligations which were part of the jurisdiction so let's say out of all the four regulations that might um, 15 were my major obligations for mm. big chunks so i'll check in that against that i'll tell my status that okay these are this is my status good bad or what is that green amber yellow mm. green mm. amber and sorry. so that one that i'll have after that um, i will then go into details that okay. i trained uh, so, so employees i uh managed so and so like let's say 100 data subject request i managed um, more than 100 vendors i reviewed more than 500 contracts i um, you know eliminated or at least uh erased or the data subject breach sorry the breach breach hmm. so basically i worked on, uh, around the breach 10 breaches i worked in a year so this is a kind of report which gets generated on a yearly basis so this report then goes to the management that what the privacy team has been doing so far in the year so Excellent. that is the idea and that was a very good point because i was i was wondering you know 
uh, what can be the holistic report we have and that and that's a great point you have covered thank you thank you so much so so on 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 this live session you know guys do let us know shall i disturb again mr pankaj for the another privacy session and i'm sure pankaj bhai will be available Yes, uh, yes. the best thing about this guys okay. is, is always available for the community and giving back to the community with the do- topic drills and all that and, and and before we wind up this you know so we do we have a review of gdpr like do we do do we have any provision of review of this controls and everything review as in you need to see what controls are there yeah, example like we have a pcrs review we have isms reviews and all that right so do we have any kind of a session timeline to review the gdpr controls effectively working or not something or um so uh, that review part probably when you do the internal audit or internal hmm. review is hmm. call it hmm. during that hmm. time only we check that okay if, whether these controls whether these ropas are working these ds as are working so understood understood any last pointer uh, pankaj bhai before we wind up this session any last pointer you want to convey to the people who are yes. looking at gdpr perspective yes uh, so don't worry if uh, even if you are not from a legal background because uh, it's not a legal background which is required just make sure that you have a good understanding of the regulation hmm. my suggestion would be to just go online read certain articles hmm. and uh, know the regulation and basis on that try to devise a program plan and like i said try to have the spots as measurable as possible because uh, the the more tiny uh, you know articulation of points you will have the more better your program will look like so excellent that is the last one i would like to say so that thank thanks you. thanks thanks pankaj thank you so much bhai yeah, and uh, can i can i share your linkedin profile in the youtube description box yes, if yes, someone yes. want to reach out to you for any kind of activities yes, yeah sure sure so team do let us know what is the next topic we can discuss on data privacy with mr pankaj uh, now uh, I, i from this particular session i got one one topic to be discussed in the next series if pankaj is available uh, myth and fact about data privacy okay <laughs> let's cover that see people say oh. you no know, like on on a gun point you know the pe- uh, the we convince the people yeah, so yeah. for me the gun point is this record session so definitely you will not say no to that <laughs> yeah yeah definitely <laughs> but thanks let's... thanks pankaj bhai thank you so much you, so this is all from our side team and uh, um if you're new to the channel do subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to make sure you should not miss the future videos with the similar topics and pankaj bhai thank you so much for this detailed insight session i you know uh, there were some pointers you know which i found very useful so i'm making a point for that because for oh, me yeah. i'm also you know getting so insight because i am also in vc so services sometimes so there yeah. some question which i asked you it was asked by my customer so i thought you know let me ask i will use this opportunity oh, and so for me it's a great learning <laughs> yeah yeah definitely definitely but thanks pankaj bhai thank you so much